Hi everyone, my name is Amar and uh, I'll be talking about our work on enabling users to control their internet. This is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Radhika Mittal at University of Il Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So here is what a typical home inter internet connection looks like. You have multiple devices um, running different applications uh, connected to a home router. And these applications download flows from different senders um, which share the same access link provided by the ISP. Um, this access link is often the bottleneck for these flows. Um, more than 50% of countries have download speeds less than 40 Mbps, whereas modern applications have high bandwidth requirements. 4K video, for example, requires more than 25 Mbps. So when such a 4K video shares the 40 Mbps access link with, um, let's say, a flow, uh, a bulk download flow, uh, which tries to hog all the bandwidth, how do we ensure that we still get good video quality? This is the question our work explores. How can a user control how their access link is shared across their incoming flows? For the scenario I discussed, how can the user give a higher weightage of, uh, to the video flow over the bulk download flow? This does seem like a very commonly occurring scenario that many of us have faced time and again. However, we were surprised to find there were no really good solutions to this. You might be thinking, are there really no good solutions? You're probably thinking prioritization or weighted fair queuing at the home router could help. But this is only helpful when the link from home router to end devices is the bottleneck and does not help when access link from ISP is the bottleneck. Instead, what would have been effective is if ISP did weighted fair queuing or prioritization at the access link, as it can directly control what packets to put on the bottleneck link. However, ISPs do not know how user would like to divide the bottleneck bandwidth across their flows, and neither do they provide any mechanism for user to specify that. And even if the, such a mechanism were in place, ISPs do not have enough visibility into traffic to appropriately classify it. Another option is to use scavenger protocols like Leadbat for low priority flows that yields bandwidth more readily to high priority flows. Again, choosing such protocols is again solely up to the sender who may not even know how the receiver would want to prioritize their flows. So both of these alternatives that I just discussed are outside the receiver's control and need explicit support from ISP or the senders uh, with who may not have enough incentive to provide such a service to begin with. So to revise our question, how can we um, enable receivers to control how their internet access link is divided across their incoming flows? Um, without any ISP or sender support. I'll be presenting CRAB, which is our solution to this problem. CRAB works solely from the receiver's domain. When operating at the home router, it does weighted sharing of the downlink uh, across devices. And when operating on the end device itself, it shares the user's share of uh, downlink bandwidth across their applications or flows. To highlight the problem and explain CRAB's working, I'll be discussing the case study of 4K video streaming in presence of bulk download. We present result from real YouTube videos and bulk transfer over the internet here. Uh, we started a YouTube video on a laptop and measured video quality using uh, YouTube's API. We also started a backlogged uh, bulk download flow. We emulated ISP-controlled access link with a bottleneck bandwidth of 30 Mbps at the home router using Linux TC. Um, to set up a baseline, uh, let's see a scenario where we just play the 4K video and nothing else. The dashed line here uh, shows the throughput over time for the video flow, um, and the shaded region is the link utilization. Um, Y-axis on your left is throughput in Mbps, and X-axis is time in seconds. The solid line shows video quality. Um, the Y-axis on your right is video quality in increasing order. So the takeaway uh, from this graph is that 30 Mbps is sufficient for video flow to reach like highest video quality of 2160p. Now we add bulk flows to the mix. Backlogged bulk flow is much more aggressive than the video flow and ends up stealing most of the bandwidth from it, which results in poor video quality. As you can see, bulk flow leaves almost no bandwidth for the video flow. Um, similar observations has been made in prior research that shows um, how video ABR algorithms do poorly in presence of bandwidth hogging flows. We next tested the ideal scenario when ISP had knowledge about how to shape traffic before the bottleneck and could do weighted fair sharing according to user preferences. 
since ISP lies just before the bottleneck uh, link, it can decide what to put um, on the link and can ensure video gets higher share of the bandwidth. Moreover, uh, when the video flow stops or pauses after filling up the buffer, ISP can reallocate unused bandwidth to the bulk flow, uh, which makes it work conserving as well. So when sharing 30 Mbps link in ratio of five to one between video and bulk flow, we get the following result. Video flow gets 25 Mbps whenever it needs it. Um, and when it is not using it, uh, for example, when, as I said, when buffer had filled up, weighted fair queuing automatically reallocates all its bandwidth to the bulk flow. This results in high video quality again. Um, but I want to reiterate that uh, this is, although this is an ideal result, but it is impractical since ISPs typically do not allow end users to do such traffic control today. So what can we do at the receiver? Well, if we somehow had an estimate of link bandwidth, we could calculate weighted fair share of each flow and throttle them to that rate. That is a big gif about knowing the link bandwidth, and I would come back to that in later half of my talk. But for now, let's assume that we know uh, what the link bandwidth is. Throttling at the receiver works because uh, senders almost always use some kind of rate control in the form of congestion control, uh, controllers, which would react to signals like packet drops or delays um, introduced by throttling. Um, and thus, the senders would back off on their sending rate uh, in a few RTDs. This empties the link for um, other flows to grow over time. For instance, ABR algorithm would use up the uh, capacity em emptied out by throttling the bulk flow in a few RTTs. So in our example, we throttled the bulk flow to 5 Mbps, uh, which left 25 Mbps for video flow to consume whenever it needed it. This definitely resulted in high video quality, um, but there is a whole lot of link underutilization as well. So how do we fix uh, this underutilization? So what we actually want to enforce are maximum weighted fair share rate. Uh, what that means is that anytime a flow's demand is less than its fair share, uh, excess capacity is reallocated to other flows. To do so, we need to infer flow demands so that we can reallocate unused bandwidth. One, one option is to do instantaneous reallocation. Um, we look at instantaneous rate at which the flow is arriving at the receiver to infer flow demands, and then instantaneously reallocate. Um, unused capacity based on it. This would be work conserving quite like weighted fair queuing uh, at the ISP result that we, show earlier, uh, we saw earlier, meaning we, could, we would not waste any bandwidth. So this is great, let's see if it really helps. And it doesn't help at all. In fact, uh, this result is quite similar to the experiment where we did nothing and allowed bulk flows to steal all bandwidth from the video flow. So why isn't instantaneous reallocation after the bottleneck effective? There are two reasons. First, flow demands based on instantaneous rates are not accurate. Um, instantaneous rates are highly influenced by how flows share the link bandwidth at the bottleneck. If the video flow got smaller share at the bottleneck, um, the perceived demand at the receiver would also be small. <clears throat> Secondly, if we reallocate immediately, this allows us to be work conserving. But that also means that we are not really throttling any flow. And if flows are not throttled, the senders are not going to react in any way, and the sending rates are not going to change, which is the reason uh, for the uh, uncanny similarity with, uh, with the status quo result. So what this means is that work conservation or 100% link utilization is fundamentally at odds uh, with our mechanism to influence the sending rate in order to control the flow shares at the bottleneck link. So what should we do? Maybe we can wait a bit after throttling. Um, so in, in, this, like in, in this version, we'll react over RTT timescales, allowing senders uh, enough chance to react to the throttling. In fact, we need to wait a few RTTs. First, we need to give bulk flow time to back off on its sending rate. And then we need to give video flow time to grow over a few RTTs as well. When the video flow stops now, we'll infer its demand over a few RTTs to make sure that it's really, uh, its demand has really reduced, at which point um, we will reallocate its capacity to bulk flow. Now the bulk flow can grow and fill the link over time. While we are waiting for the impact of throttling to kick in, we do end up underutilizing the link for 
some time. But as I just mentioned, um, some amount of link under utilization is imminent in order to effectively control the flow shares. And this strategy works. Not, not only the video quality is highest, but at times when the video flow is not using all its share, bulk flow is filling in the gaps. This is great, but let's go back to our big assumption. So all this works only if we're able to estimate link bandwidth to a reasonable extent. But how do we do that? We can again infer link bandwidth similar to flow demands by monitoring the incoming traffic. But this is not as straightforward. Firstly, detecting increases in link bandwidth is challenging since um, we are throttling flows ourselves. We cannot really detect increases in link bandwidth by measuring incoming uh, traffic rate since it's not going to increase because we have, uh, as I said, like throttled the flows ourselves. So to get around it, we periodically do passive bandwidth probing. We increase bandwidth share of a, few, uh, of a flow by fractional amount and detect changes in per flow throughput in next few RTTs. This brings up some important questions. Which flow should we pick for bandwidth probing? So we pick a random saturating flow. A saturating flow is a flow that, um, that is utilizing all its previously assigned share of bandwidth, which is a signal for us that it can probably grow more and can help us with bandwidth probing. Next, what amount should we use for the fractional increment? We do not want to use a very large increment because uh, that will end up affecting the weighted sharing of flows, which we actually want to uh, enforce. But we also don't want to be very slow at probing. Uh, so when a probing, probing, probe, probing event is successful, we double the increment in subsequent probe um, until it fails. In that case, we reset it to a smaller increment. <coughs> so this lets us detect increases in link bandwidth. What about decreases in uh, link bandwidth? So differentiating between drop in link bandwidth versus drop in a flow's demand is practically impossible. We do not want to spuriously decrease bandwidth since it takes some time to probe for more bandwidth as we just saw. So we first try to reallocate, and this should help if the drop in arrival rate is due to a drop in flows demand. When reallocation does not help, we end up reducing the bandwidth estimate. So here is a simple micro benchmark to show working of bandwidth estimation. The solid line here uh, shows the link bandwidth. It is at 30 Mbps, then it goes down to 10 Mbps, and then it uh, increases back to 30 Mbps. And our goal is to share the link bandwidth between uh, two flows, the red one and blue one, in ratio of two to one. Um, so we start off strong, uh, 30 Mbps is being shared in ratio of two to one between the red and blue flow. You can also see bandwidth probing events happening here, which are like obviously unsuccessful because link bandwidth has not really increased. Um, uh, let's move on to the scenario when bandwidth drops. So there is some unevenness at start. Uh, this is when Crab is trying to do reallocation to fix the problem, but it's not helping. Eventually, it reduces the bandwidth estimate, at which point we see that uh, sh shares have an, again converged to two to one ratio. Now, when the link bandwidth uh, increases, blue flow is, uh, as you can see, selected for uh, bandwidth probing. And once the bandwidth has been probed, uh, we update our link bandwidth estimate, and with, at which point, again, we're sharing the link in ratio of two to one. So, Putting it all together, um, a user wants to control how their uh, downlink flows share the bottleneck at access link. Um, so user can give their preferences in a config file. They can define a flow as a group of flow identifiers along with a weight. Flow identifier can be an IP address, some application, a web domain, or even a URL. These flow identifiers are translated into packet uh, identifiers by the flow filter manager which installs rules specifying how to classify incoming traffic into multiple queues at the ingress. You can find more details about how we uh, do flow management in the paper. To measure flow demands, we measure throughput of uh, flows over multiple RTTs at the ingress. These measurements, along with the flow weights from the config file, are fed to the rate computation module, which is doing reallocation and um, bandwidth probing logic that I discussed earlier. This calculates the rate of each flow group and assigns DQ rate to each of these queues. And over time, traffic is shaped uh, as desired uh, as senders react to the throttle rates. Um, Crab can also be deployed at the home router to share access link bandwidth between devices. 
The only difference is that config file in router crab would contain destination IP address instead of apps or web domains or source IP addresses. But the good thing is that we require no kind of coordination between crab running at home router and crab running at the end device. Um, I already discussed some results um, of video streaming in presence of bulk downloads in this uh, presentation, where CRAB resulted in a significant improvement in video quality. We also found CRAB to be helpful for web browsing, where it improved uh, web page load times by, by a factor of two in presence of bulk flows. We also did some other micro benchmarks to test various scenarios. You can, uh, again, find these details in paper. I would like to finish my talk with some discussion points. Um, I discussed the example of a home network in my talk, but CRAB can also be applied to other contexts like enterprise networks or coffee shops, et cetera. Um, there are some limitations to CRAB's usage as well. Since bandwidth probing works over multiple RTTs, it does not do a good job over very volatile links like cellular networks where link capacity can change over uh, sub-RTT time scale. Um, since CRAB works by throttling the flows and having senders react to throttling, very short-lived flows may not benefit from CRAB since they finish within a few RTTs. But at the same time, CRAB does not harm them either. Lastly, as I discussed, uh, as, as I discussed earlier, there is going to be some transient and digitalization um, because, because of the working of CRAB. Um, with that, I want to thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.